left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives. Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Hello there at six o'clock and I'm Michelle Jubri. Coming up tonight, Rishi Sunak says that our nuclear capability is a cornerstone of our national security. Do you agree with that or not? Also as well, let's talk about China. I'm asking you a simple question. Do you think we need to get tougher with them? I do. Also coming up today, it's such a big topic, this one, a damning report out today on the subject of social cohesion says that almost 80% of us are fearful of voicing our true feelings in public because of potential reprisals. Your thoughts on that? The report also lays bare the absolutely shocking failures around the treatment of the Batley school teacher. There is so much to get into on this report and we'll cover it all. Also, I want to ask you about transport. Is it time now basically to move transport under public ownership. Lots of that going on in Yorkshire. Uh, is it a good idea though or not? Also, some criminals will be required to wear high-vis jackets and clean up the communities that they've damaged. Good is what I say, but other people are saying it's wrong to humiliate people this way. Your thoughts? We'll get into all of that and more over the next hour, but before we do, let's cross live for the six o'clock news headlines. Michelle, thank you, and good evening to you. Well, the top story from the GB Newsroom tonight is that the Deputy Prime Minister has accused China of being responsible for two malicious cyber campaigns targeting the Electoral Commission. Databases containing the names and addresses of 40 million registered voters were visible to hackers in 2021 and 2022, but the government says it did not affect the outcome of local elections at the time. China has reacted angrily to the accusations, with branding the claims fabricated and malicious slanders. Well, Oliver Darden told the Commons today that the government wants to be as open as possible with the British public about the attack, and he said national cyber security support will be helping political parties make sure they're protected from foreign influence in the run-up to the general election. We want now to be as open as possible with the House and with the British public, because part of our defence is calling out this behaviour. This is the latest in a clear pattern of hostile activity originating in China, including the targeting of democratic institutions and parliamentarians in the United Kingdom and beyond. Oliver Dowden. Now, Rishi Sunak is facing another by-election in a red wall seat. After Scott Benton resigned as an MP, the Blackpool South member was already facing a recall petition. Mr Benton, who's now running as an independent, was found to have broken Commons rules when he was caught out in a sting by the Times newspaper offering to act on behalf of gambling investors. Shadow Paymaster General Jonathan Ashworth says his resignation has come too late. They should have done it much sooner, frankly, and the Tory party should have made him resign much sooner. I mean, it's absolutely chaos, isn't it, in the Tory party today? A divided party, from, divided from top to bottom, and weak leadership under Rishi Sunak. We need this by-election now as soon as possible. The Tories should move the writ and let's get on and let, let's elect a Labour MP who can represent the people of Blackpool here in the House of Commons. Jonathan Ashworth. Now, in the United States, Donald Trump has today won his bid to pause his £360 million civil fraud judgment if he posts a bond of £140 million in 10 days. If you're watching on television, the following does contain some flashing images. It is a victory for the former US president, as it means that New York state authorities can't now seize his assets. He had been facing a deadline today to post bond for the fine, which he was given for inflating his net worth. If he didn't meet the deadline, he could have faced having his assets, such as Trump Tower or his plane, seized. Here, the Crown Prosecution Service has been cleared of wrongdoing in accepting the plea of triple killer Valdo Calacane without going to trial, a new report says. 
Grace O'Malley Kumar and Barnaby Webber, along with school caretaker Ian Coates, were killed in June last year in Nottingham in a spate of knife attacks while Kalakani was suffering from schizophrenia. He was sentenced to a hospital order instead of being sent to prison. The Crown Prosecution Service Inspectorate said the correct decision was made in accepting the manslaughter pleas on the grounds of diminished responsibility. Two men have been found guilty of murdering a footballer on the dance floor of a nightclub on Boxing Day. 23-year-old Cody Fisher was killed shortly before midnight by a masked group at the Crane Club in Birmingham in 2022. Police have released CCTV footage, or CCTV footage of the night he was killed. 23-year-old Remy Gordon and 22-year-old Cammie Carpenter were convicted today. A third defendant, 19-year-old Regan Anderson, was found not guilty of murder. A new review into social cohesion in Britain has revealed chilling levels of so-called harassment posing a serious threat to schools. The review, led by government adviser Dame Sarah Khan, found that more than 75% of the public feel they can't speak their mind. 27% have employed security or moved jobs or house. As part of her review... Dame Sarah is recommending the establishment of an exclusion zone for protests outside schools. And lastly, Sarah, Duchess of York, says she's full of admiration for the Princess of Wales after the announcement about her treatment for cancer. Writing on social media today, the Duchess said she hopes Kate will now be given the time, space and privacy to heal. Those are your top stories. For the very latest news, sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Thanks very much for that. Polly, I am Michelle Jubry and I'm with you till 7 o'clock tonight. So if you're listening to those headlines there, are you in Blackpool? Uh, in Blackpool South, that uh, seat there, that we're going to have another uh, high election. I always hear it. I, I say it in like Brenda from Bristol's accent in my own mind. Uh, if you are in that seat, I wonder, do you think that is the right move? Are you relishing the prospect of a by-election or not? Will you even bother turning out? I'm fascinated to hear from you tonight. Uh, alongside me, till 7, keeping me company, the Deputy Leader of Reform UK, Ben Habib, and the broadcast journalist Judita De Silva. Good evening to both of you. Um, I bet you're relishing a by-election, but I'm not going to get into that. I want my, uh, my Blackpool uh, viewers to tell me their thoughts. You know how to get hold of me tonight. GBviews at gbnews.com is how you can email me or you can tweet or X me at gbnews. I really want to get it, uh, stuck into tonight this big report out today about social cohesion or lack of, actually. So many people actually dare even really say what they think anymore because they're terrified about the ramifications of that. Uh, I want to look at these so-called uh, communities Community leaders, self-appointed by the way, uh, that seem to be causing uh, quite a few problems in certain scenarios. I want to explore all of it. There was uh, very damning findings as well when it comes to the Batley school teacher. We'll get into all of that, worry not. But before we do, let's talk China, shall we? Because the Prime Minister has described China as the biggest threat to the UK's economic security. Now I can cross live uh, to our GB News Home and Security Editor, Mark White. Good evening to you, Mark. Bring my viewers up to speed with what on earth has been going on now? Well, these are cyber attacks that have taken place uh, over the last few years, in fact, that the government has now pointed the finger firmly at the Chinese state. Uh, in particular, an attack that happened in 2021, uh, which attacked the um, Electoral Commission uh, and some 40 million People's details were compromised during that attack. Also, at that time, 43 individuals, including MPs and peers, were the victims of cyber attacks as well. So the government coming out today and pointing the finger, as I say, firmly at Beijing. Uh, but I have to say, listening to the Deputy Prime Minister as he made his statement to the Commons and then listening to the reaction of MPs in the chamber, it was a sense of, well, is that it? You know, it had been heavily trailed in the newspapers that this was the British government uh, about to get really tough with the Chinese government for what has been going on. But really, all that was uh, mentioned in the way of any kind of sanctions here were a couple of officials who are on the sanctions list and uh, a very small company with about 50 employees 
also being sanctioned. And in addition to that, the Chinese ambassador will be summoned before the Foreign Secretary some three years after the events. Uh, one of the MPs in the chamber said it was as if the government had gone to a gunfight with a wooden spoon. Uh, Ian Duncan Smith, the former um, head of the, uh, well, the leader of the Conservative Party, himself an outspoken critic of the Chinese Communist Party and who has been the subject of a number of cyber attacks, he said uh, the government's approach was uh, like an elephant giving birth to a mouse. He said that he wouldn't be intimidated by what Beijing was doing. He would continue to be an outspoken critic of the Chinese government. But he's been the subject of multiple uh, cyber attacks uh, over the years, including on one occasion uh, someone who was impersonating him, emailing lots of contacts of his, saying that he'd recanted his views on the Chinese state. Um, so that's kind of dirty tricks that they're up to. It is a big and a, going, a growing problem, not just China, but Russia, North Korea, Iran, a number of other countries that want to sow division in Western democracies. Indeed, fascinating stuff. That's our Home and Security Editor, Mark White. Thank you very much. I mean, I've got to say, I was trying not to laugh, actually, at some of the descriptions that have been used, but I, I dare say that Beijing are probably not quaking in their boots right now. No, I don't think they're quaking at all. And it is a homemade problem, isn't it? Over the last 20 years, we've had successive governments actually trading with China, um, getting progressively friendlier with China. Only four years ago, to, uh, uh, five years ago, Theresa May was thinking of having our next nuclear facility built by China. Four years ago, Boris Johnson was going to put Huawei through our 5G network. And even David to... Cameron, of course, he's coming under fire today did, as well. Absolutely. So and Osborne. I mean, they were the ones who wanted to take China under their wing. And we've created an unholy relationship with China where we trade. We, our trade is so dependent on cheap Chinese product, mm. including, by the way, electric vehicles, which are now flooding Western Europe and, uh, and the UK, which presumably could be switched off by the flick of a switch in Beijing. Um, so we've got really unjoined up or non-joined up thinking on China. And the last foreign policy point I'd just like to make is that we've all sat back in the West and allowed China to roll out its Belt and Roads program right across Africa, uh, South Asia, establishing a political and economic presence in countries which we have eschewed relationships with because they're not democratic or for whatever our high-minded idealistic principles are, when actually we should have been taking steps to see China out of those resource-rich countries. We've sat here, invited China into the position it's in, and we've been asleep on, on it. And the last thing I'll just quickly say is Donald Trump warned us about China mm. when he was president, and everyone rolled their eyes at him. The liberal, educated elite all thought this was Trump, you know, doing another Trumpian kind of... Do uh, you remember the skit, the skit where you just see Donald Trump re repeatedly saying, China, China, China? It's because China. he was warning us about China, as he did about Russia. We've been asleep at the wheel, and now we've got to take a... We, by the way, I don't think a knee-jerk reaction to China now is going to be the answer. We've got to take a measured response, which extricates ourselves from this problem carefully. Um, I just want to bring in a couple of viewers before I bring you in, uh, Jadita. Gary says, uh, Michelle, it's all very simple. We simply cannot do without China anymore. It, but yeah, it makes that point that we've just been hearing there as well, which is pretty much everything um, that we use now seems to have been uh, either made entirely in China or certainly components of. Uh, David says the thing that would scare China the most is if we started to make our own things uh, once more. He says, though, perhaps uh, we've let our manufacturing sectors though, go to rack and Ruin, haven't we? David uh, says, Michelle, you've all gone bonkers. Not only at GB News, but the country at large. He says, who on earth wants to actually take on China? Um, Boris, etc., thinks we should be taking on China as well. He says, meanwhile, you can't even protect a Batley school teacher. What are you guys on? He asks. But you don't quite ask it like that, but it's tea time, but that's how I've summarised it. Uh, Jadidza, what do you think? Um, I do agree that it's a self-created problem. But the situation you're, they're finding themselves, you're finding yourselves in in the UK now is China is, has become the second largest economy in the world. That's not by accident. They have their 
particularly adept at high productivity at low cost, which they outsource to the world. And that's what the world has taken advantage of. So it was the writing was on the wall from the beginning. What you have now here is China trying to test that having had, this has been decades in the building, and now they're trying to test the resilience of what they've built. When you've webbed yourself out, the dependency on your country throughout the world, how much power and influence do I have, particularly on an influential power like the UK? Now they've done something as fundamental wrong as breaching the electorate. You've got to do something. You've got to be seen to do something, and that something has to have effect. It cannot look like a slap on the wrist. But, like, but what then? Do what? That's what you have to think about, because the what they're going to be thinking is, how do I mitigate risk? Because Xi Jinping, like Putin, is a reactionary leader. If you take out sanctions, they will return fire. Can the UK withstand that? What the UK should have been doing is outsourcing dependency. The things you need China for, you should be finding under other countries to do it but for that ship you. Is now. But, but with That's problems that. like this, well, we... it's too late. When you talk about too late, that is true, but you've got to build going forward. You've got to make very quick changes, very substantive changes now, so that five years down the line, you can contend with not having China be so, being so dependent on China. Otherwise, all they're going to prove to you, to you is that the UK needs us, and so we can do anything with the UK without any reaction. It always blows my mind, you know, that China um, seems to just got off the hook for COVID. They brought the world's economies pretty much to its knees and then some. The what, Wuhan what, virus. What consequences <laughs> were there for that? Nothing. Yeah, well, the WHO is, uh, you know, one of its largest funders is China. Mm. And we're about, by the way, to hand over pandemic management in this country to the WHO. It's daft as brushes. It is. Let me ask you as well, another thing that's caught my eye today in the world of politics is Rishi Sunak. He's been speaking out about the importance uh, of basically nuclear when it comes to our defence, uh, earmarking a lot more uh, money to be spent in that area as well. Do you agree with him? I do think we, we must have a nuclear deterrent. I don't think Ukraine would have been invaded by Russia had we the West, U United States, UK and Russia signed a treaty with them in 1994, disarming them of their, uh, of their nuclear weapons. But the sad thing is, our Triton deterrent system doesn't work. They tried to test it in 2016, it failed. They tested it on 30th January, it failed. So Putin must be looking at the Trident nuclear deterrent and thinking, well, my goodness. But they came out, didn't they, and said, actually, it only failed just because of a few of the seconds. Oh, yeah. Actually, sure. in, in real life... Sure, of, of course, Michelle. In a real live firing situation, it would have worked like a dream, absolutely. The test failed, but it'll be fine in, on the night. Do you <laughs> um, agree that uh, nuclear is a key part of our deterrent? Um, overall, I don't... I think you're going down a slippery slope. In general, when you look at the, the lay of the land in the world today, yes, it is, it is key. But the fact is, I, I keep going to this quote from Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer, where at the end, one of the scientists says that, yeah, it's all well and good for now until somebody else builds a bigger bomb. If you, build, you bolster your nuclear <coughs> capability, other countries will think, oh, I've got to bolster mine so it's bigger. And you keep going, and you keep going. Where does it end? Until you get to a point where everybody says that this is such a danger, no one can use it. This is just a problem that's going to get beyond our control if people don't cease to think that this is the only way to go. But would you, like in the climate as it is, with some of the leaders as they are, we've just been touching upon some of them, surely uh, you wouldn't think, you know what, let's start moving towards uh, scrapping Trident or scaling it back or anything? I think that's the way to go, but it's like I'm in two minds where, based on if everybody comes to the gunfight with guns, you've got to show up with a gun, otherwise you're an idiot. Mm. But the fact is, who started it? And the, you have to unify the mentality of everyone, saying that we can still be enemies, but we've got to find a different way to fight, because this is detrimental to everyone. It's uh, well, I mean, I, soon, I think the nuclear deterrent has kept peace throughout the Cold War. You know, if it wasn't for the nuclear deterrent, we might have had a hot war with, with, with the USSR as it was then much earlier. But we did have the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty for many years. And, of course, now that's lying in waste as Russia is rebuilding its... expanding its nuclear arsenal. But our arsenal doesn't even work, Michelle. That's my point. The United Kingdom is so broken in its defence capability, not just nuclear, but also conventional, which is, which is absolutely crucial. You've got to have a strong conventional army. And we've hollowed out that army repeatedly. I saw Shaps today was talking about we're in a pre-war period. You're always in a pre-war period. You're either at war or you're in a pre-war yeah. period. There is no such thing as a peace dividend, which is a 
two most, um, you know, the, a combination of two words that's hijacked the defense of this country. There was never a peace dividend. We always had to pay the money required to have a strong military, so we had the insurance required to make sure people like Putin would never think of attacking the United Kingdom. That's how it works. No, but throughout history, there's always been rogue elements. There will always be individuals that believe that you can't, they are not answerable to the collective. So if you have this deterrent that everyone functions in a way that if you move, we can move too, there'll be one person that says, I don't care. And we've seen that throughout history. And because there are those rogue elements and history has taught us they keep coming, you should not provide a landscape where they can thrive in a way that is detrimental to the world. Uh, anyone that's been to Hiroshima like I have, you've seen the, uh, the absolute devastation that these bombs uh, create and by then I mean don't forget that was quite a smaller uh, one compared to today's standards but one of the things that always baffles me because I would like to live in a world that's that you don't need nuclear deterrence yeah. so wonderful but that's not real life at the moment is it? it's not we don't live in a perfect world and I always find it fascinating when people ask potential leaders would you press that button they start floundering around it's as though they dare say yes I would I find it so odd because what is the point in having a deterrent if you wouldn't boldly say, yeah, damn right, I would press that button if my peoples uh, were threatened in that way? What do you make to it all? Do you think this is all needed or do you think it's time to start scaling it back or even scrapping it? Your thoughts, GB views at GBnews.com is how you reach me. Coming up after the break, I want to talk to you about this very important report uh, that's out today all about extremism, social cohesion. There is much to unpick and we'll get into it in two. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Now, I'm sure you have seen this video that went viral this week, and if you I haven't, really well, I think you're going to enjoy it. Uh, this is a firefighter leaning on a fence whilst watching a trapped driving instructor's car sink. <laughs> in four feet of flood water. Looks very comfortable there, doesn't he? Just leaning against the Just fence. chilling, just yeah. relaxing. Uh, yeah, there were two... Uh, so there were, in fact, two Essex fire and rescue crews, an ambulance and a police car parked near the sinking vehicle, but they wouldn't enter the water because they had to wait for specialist crews who were trained for, uh, for the water depth. Uh, well, two people who weren't going to sit back and watch were these two, Jack and Danielle Price, who took it upon themselves to rescue the submerged driver, and Danielle joined us now. Very good morning to you, Danielle. And you are a hero, an absolute hero. What happened in this video? Make sense of it for us. So we were filming in the area for our YouTube channel and we've seen the fire brigade come through. I was actually out at five o'clock in the morning with my husband, Jamie. We, we know it always happens there, as you can see. Um, and it was clear. We've seen the fire brigade come through, we've followed them, and they're just standing around as if nothing's happened. Um, in the clip, it says um, he's fine, he's, he's, he's on his phone, um, and then sort of walked away. But what they failed to realise is when my partner actually opened the door, as you can hear, he's on the phone to the, 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 sort of the emergency crew in panic, thinking he's going to sink. Um, so we could not just sit there and watch. Um, he's absolutely terrified. Yeah, poor bloke. Well done, you. Do you reckon this is health and safety gone mad? It is, because although I do sympathise with them, they are so red taped, but surely sort of common sense has to kick in as open the door. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
Crikey. Hello there. Uh, I'm joined by Deputy Leader of Reform UK, Ben Habib, and the broadcast journalist, uh, Jadita De Silva. It all goes on uh, in the breaks in this programme, I can tell you, ladies and gents. Uh, let's have a look what you guys have been saying to that first uh, story, shall we? Um, someone here is saying, Janet, you sum it up quite well. Uh, you say we'd have world peace if us women ruled the world. Agree with that? Yes, I do. Do you? I do. Short and sweet there. Yeah. Uh, any, men, <laughs> any men out there? But can a man self-identify <laughs> as a woman and then equally run the world well? Oh, well, there you go. You're opening up a whole can of worms. A whole can of worms. And I'll tell you what has also opened uh, a whole can of worms. Have you seen the Khan review that's been released today? It was all about focusing on so-called social cohesion and extremism in the UK. Uh, I confess, for the, one of the first times, actually, I've read all 150 pages of it. I might have fallen to sleep a couple of times during that reading, so don't test me on it all. Uh, but I've got to say, in all seriousness, I really found it quite chilling, actually. Um, let me just show you, just first of all, a clip um, from the editor of this report. You say that three quarters of people can't express their views. What do you mean? So what I describe in my report is this phenomenon called freedom restricting harassment, which is when people experience or witness threatening, intimidatory or abusive harassment, either online or offline, which is then intended to make individuals or institutions self-censor out of fear. So let's just have a little look, um, drill into some of these uh, statistics that we were just mentioning there from the author. I can just bring these up. So 85% of the public believe um, that this situation, this freedom restricting harassment that we've just described, uh, occurs in the UK. 60% of it believe the problem is worse now than five years ago. Nearly 80% of the public reported restricting their personal views in public. And nearly 70% of people uh, feel that basically they have to try and change the way that they uh, live their lives due to this stuff. I mean, I find that fascinating and really quite concerning that nearly 80% of British public, according to this report, cannot be honest about what they feel. I, and uh, and it, it is terrible. And we know that from 2016. Do you remember? We, we were ashamed, some of us, not me, but some of us, ashamed to claim that we were Brexiteers because, you know, somehow if you wanted the United Kingdom to become an independent sovereign country, you were a far right or a lunatic swivel eyed. That's how bizarre the conversation had got. And it's got progressively worse since then. I made a joke earlier on about, you know, a, a man identifying as a woman and running the world. But actually, nowadays, if you talk out against uh, the trans ideology or you talk against critical race theory or you challenge Black Lives Matter or you challenge diversity, equality and inclusion, which I think is more like division, inequality and exclusion, you are castigated in the institutions in which you work. So people are being shut down. Debate is being shut down. Diversity of thought is being shut down. And we talk about, the report talks about Islamic extremism and extre extremism on the right. Actually, there is a far left extremism that's going on. Mm -hmm. It is the far left that is shutting down debate in this country because it thinks it has settled all the major ideological and philosophical debates that we have to have. And if we don't accept their position on it, then we're somehow out of sync. Is that fair, Judita? Um, not, and I don't think so, because what you can't, we kind of have a situation now in society that it's all about reactionary politics. The theory of what social um, cohesion is about works. It works on a, they talk about a horizontal and a vertical, a vertical level. And it's a deal hierarchically and to the different niveau of soci, um, socioeconomic class. And when you think about it, it's basically talking about the recognition of individuals who can function together to make the totality more positive, more productive and more successful. That is great. You're basically describing a utopia. What happens is within the fault lines of that structure, you have people that feel threatened that if it's almost like McCarthy, the McCarthy era, the fear of communism as being antithetical to the capitalist ideals of America, that you believe that there should be a, po a potential for hierarchy because there's rich and there is poor. But if you see everyone as equal, it destroys your ability to be better than others. That, is a, that was an issue. We saw how that played out. With here, there's a fear that certain groups or certain people can no longer feel enabled or superior or powerful if everyone is seen as the same, which is not the truth of it. And so you get certain voices that exploit that insecurity or that feeling that I'm not quite sure, and they f stoke the flames of paranoia. 
and insecurity. And then you have a situation where there are people who are seen on the outside, people who are seen on the inside, and they're saying that by them, they are threatening you, and therefore, you never actually meet in the middle to just talk. Look at the three of us. We have different ideals on different things, but there is zero animosity between us. We can have a conversation, we can disagree, and then move on and coexist. Mm. That is something that has come out of what? Conversation. Mm. You understand where I come from, why I come from there because of conversation. Most of the times that the, there's such violence, disagreements, they've never actually just talked to each other and listened because all you've done is stoke fear and preconception but and create I... an idea that this person is not like me and therefore not for me. Yeah, but can I just challenge that? Because it is perfectly acceptable in everyday life to say black lives matter. It would not be it would not be uh, socially acceptable to say white lives matter. It's perfectly acceptable for Sadiq Khan to say at least 40% of the Met should be from ethnic minorities, but it would be impossible for anyone to say at least 60% of the Met should be white, which is the inverse of the same statement. There is an absolute hijacking of debate, and it comes from the left. It comes from Sadiq Khan and people like that who don't want their principles challenged, who want the division. They want identity politics because there through. Are, I do agree there are certain people who do that, but what always frustrates me about the Black Lives Matter conversations, I always ask people that: How many black people do you just talk to? about Black Lives Matter, like, just talk to me about it. Because when you say that, oh, if you said White Lives Matter, my reaction is like, do you understand what Black Lives Matter is about? It's because our existence has been so subhuman and subpar for so long that all we're saying is that we just want to matter the same as everyone else. That's but then the you should say all lives matter. There is you know, no, there's no matter. antidote. You know, the thing, all lives yeah. do matter, but they don't matter equally yet. So what we're saying is that bring it to an equilibrium and Black Lives Matter wouldn't exist anymore. No, but what you're proposing is to uh, promote Black Lives over and above everyone else's yeah. life in order to make well, the point... It was spurred on by George Floyd. Show me footage of any white person who has been put... who has eight-minute footage of basically being slowly murdered by a police oh, it, officer. Oh, it, it has happened. Sure. I mean, I, I, I don't think, by the way, that, that that is actually relevant to the debate. It is relevant no, to the debate because it was the flashpoints that spurred on the power of what Black Lives Matter is today. It has changed the status quo because it was such a dehumanising <laughs> and evil thing to watch in real time. No, yeah, but it Thanks has... to social media, it has given black people a voice to vocalise what their everyday lived experience has been that yeah. they felt they could but never you talk don't, about before. But you don't achieve equality by demanding superiority. I mean, I even no, see black, now claims... I'm saying about that's why talk to black people. That, you remember the, what I said before yeah. about a preconception going in? Yeah. You have to eradicate preconception. I have no desire to be superior to anyone. I have every desire to be equal to everyone. But help me understand this notion, because you just said a second ago then about black people being treated as though they're su subhuman. And the, I'm got charting it through history, from slavery to Jim no, Crow to colonisation. In present day, in pre a black person no. is not treated as though they're subhuman in this jo country no. by any stretch of um, anyone's imagination. Armand Aubrey. Um, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, I consider that to be subhuman treatment. Well, OK, and stick that with George Floyd, then, because yeah. that's your example that you're using. Was that... How do we know that that officer's awful, um, horrendous behaviour, and he's in prison now, obviously, how do we know that that was motivated by the colour of George Floyd's skin? That's where the point I just asked. Please... Sh I can... Break, like, we... We're a horrible thing to do, but I can literally log on and just show because they talk about tra like the trauma of social media. That we're, especially when you have your algorithms, just video after video after video of what happens to black people. No, under... I've seen this video of George. Yes, I'm asking but you I said question. that. How do you know that it's behavior different? Was was motivated by the color because, of his skin? Because because I'm saying that use the complete the exact same formula and show me the same numbers of that equal kind of treatment to white people and I will be quiet. No, no, Jesus, that, that's not that's is, not right. No, there is it's going down to it's, it's this has been studied throughout history there is a perception that comes from fear and why is it that we live we and i'm saying this from lived experience i can walk down my street in the suburbs dressed like this it's one thing just wearing clothes it's clothes but it's called a hoodie it's a problem. i've had my neighbors call the police on my brother because he was filming our own house in a hoodie and I saw police walk <coughs> him into the house well, and ask on. for his ID. Hold on our streets, we've been on for decades. Well, hold on because a, a black person is wearing clothes. If some random oh. guy is in a hoodie filming a house, then that would no, but that's cause the point. suspicion. No, but that's what I just said. He's not a random guy. We've grown up in that house. We've been there for 30 years. Yeah, but if, you, years. if you've got your hoodie on, how do you even know where it is? Yeah.
He's the same. He walks down that street every but day. The two. Whatever, he's we've had the same. Day, we've had the house. same. We, he's, we've had the same neighbors for decades. It's our house. He went filming your house. He was on our property. Filming but are you our saying? House. Are you saying that the United Kingdom? is basically racist against no, ethnic I am not. So no, what I are you not. saying? I am saying that you cannot invalidate the racist experiences that black people have had throughout their lifetime that makes them feel that they have an existence that isn't like but white people's. And by recognizing it, appreciating and acting in a way that can remedy it going further, they feel that they're going to be integrated into society in a way that makes them feel equal. The, That's all. The only way to achieve equality is to demand equality not for the promotion of ethnic minorities over and above and, if necessary, to the detriment of no, the majority. No, over and above? But uh, because the regulatory framework under which we operate, mm -hmm. diversity, we discussed this last time on the programme, diversity, equality and inclusion requires the promotion of minorities. It requires that institutions recruit ethnic minorities, transgender, um, more women, uh, a, a multiplicity of different... It doesn't require the promotion, it requires the inclusion. It, it requires the appointment of and the reporting on the number of ethnic minorities you have on your board, in your programmes and so on. The RAF, for example, spent £2 million seek, uh, on DEI and the RAF has a policy, a stated policy, of trying to get more ethnic jet fighter pilots in rather than one based on meritocracy. Martin Luther King said right at the beginning, it's not about the colour of your skin, it's about the content of your character. And that is the only way we can create equality. Well, I'll, I'll carry this conversation on, actually. It's very interesting. There's so much to unpick about this report. Um, one of the things that features heavily in this report is the Batley Grammar School teacher. You remember that story. Listen to this. You mentioned now the case of the school in Batley where a teacher had to go into hiding um, for, for uh, discussing and dealing with and looking at a, 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 with the children, a caricature of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, how many other Batleys are there? Well, I, I can tell you there have been lots of teachers who've experienced threats and abuse. I mean, I had many teachers contact me describing this level of fear that they have. And there's a new polling out recently that showed that teachers are very fearful about teaching some of these issues because they worry about the backlash that they're going to experience. The problem we have at the moment is, is that the Department for Education don't collect this level of data. So we don't actually know the full scale of it. I think that this is just the tip of the iceberg. I can tell you now, right, this notion of fear, the amount of fear that people have right now in society is absolutely immense. Why in this day and age do we have a scenario where teachers and counsellors, and it goes on and on in this report, are terrified because of groups threatening them and the police do pretty much nothing? We'll come to that after the break. This is your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Good evening to you. The rest of this week, well, be prepared for further heavy downpours and temperatures staying around about or a little bit below average. Low pressure is well and truly in control of our weather and will be for the rest of this week. These weather fronts have been making for a pretty soggy day for much of the UK. The rain across Scotland, falling of snow over the hills, that continues in the east through the night. Elsewhere, it does turn a little bit drier. Uh, staying fairly cloudy and um, staying fairly chilly. Temperatures down into single figures, not far off freezing in northern Scotland and small wintry showers coming into the northern and the western isles as we go into Tuesday. Still a bit more snow over the Grampians, although that should ease. Further showers, though, to come on the east coast of Scotland. Central and southern Scotland looking a little bit drier compared to today. It'll be a wetter day, though, for the southeast as that rain moves in through Tuesday and that spreads into the Midlands and rain again for Northern Ireland. But something a bit brighter in the southwest and south wales and for eastern england too some glimmers of sunshine but it is going to feel pretty chilly particularly across scotland where the rain and hill snow continues into wednesday and then elsewhere it's bands of showers moving in be prepared for some heavy downpours on wednesday there will be some brighter spells between the heavy showers a bit of sunshine we'll see temperatures up to double digits but generally feeling cooler in the breeze and plenty more of those heavy showers to come in the run-up to easter 
GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Hi there, I'm Michelle Jubri, keeping you company till 7 o'clock tonight. Um, uh, Judita De Silva and Ben Habib remain alongside me. There's lots that I want to talk to you about. Um, uh, not least, though, this report that's been issued today. Um, have you seen this report? It's all about the lack of social cohesion, basically, the amount of extremism, uh, the amount of fear that exists in society about people actually being honest about what they truly um, think and feel. I want to read this. There's a lot of case studies within this report. One of them is from a council leader. And they say, as a leader of a council, I've received thousands of death threats, letters and messages saying that people are following me home, threats to my two-year-old daughter about being gang raped and trafficked. Um, they say, I received these messages either as letters to my home, uh, sorry, to the office or direct messages on Twitter or online forums. I have to make my daughter sleep next to a fire blanket in case someone firebombs my home as a previous councillor has had her property firebombed. Um, she says, people are fearful. They want to defend me publicly, but they know too well um, that experience pylons will happen if they do. The response from the police has been dismal, and I've had little support. It's made me question whether I want to stay in politics. And this kind of story, these case studies, are echoed throughout this report. Um, and I played you the story about the Batley Grammar School. In fact, actually, let me just replay that clip in case you've just tuned in, you don't know what I'm talking about. Listen to the reports. All you mentioned there the case of the school in Batley, where a teacher had to go into hiding um, for, for uh, discussing and dealing with and looking at a, 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 with the children a caricature of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, how many other Batleys are there? Well, I, I can tell you there have been lots of teachers who've experienced threats and abuse. I mean, I had many teachers contact me describing this level of fear that they have. And uh, there's a, a new polling out recently that showed that teachers are very fearful about teaching some of these issues because they worry about the backlash that they're going to experience. The problem we have at the moment is, is that the Department of Education don't collect this level of data. So we don't actually know the full scale of it. I think that this is just the tip of the iceberg. I think it's the tip of the iceberg, too. Um, I, I, I do, too, a, yeah. She talks a lot about so-called uh, self-appointed, like, community leaders getting involved, sticking their nose in in terms of what can and what can't be taught, what teachers are allowed to say and what they're not allowed to say. And, it's and it'll on. vary from community to community. And I think what we're seeing here, Michelle, is the evidence of multiculturalism completely failing. And we talked about... The, the report, I think, is headed social cohesion. Well, the word social... Society requires a common culture, a common language, common laws. All these things are set aside by multiculturalism. What we do with multiculturalism is say, you can practice your own culture in your silo. There's no obligation on any of us to mix with you or any, any attempt made to integrate, any attempt for a common value system or common cultural heritage to develop. You can speak your own language. And in some cases in this country, you can practice your own law. 
alongside British law, which I find absolutely abominable. So when, when we talk about social cohesion, there's no surprise that we don't have it. We have a broken society because of multiculturalism. We have had rampant immigration over the last 25 years with no attempt made and none possible, given the speed at which people have been coming in, none possible to create an integrated, settled, settled, what I would call a settled social construct. So I'm not surprised at all by that report. And I do hold by what I said earlier. People are very shy of saying what they believe because some group or another will be offended. People in my office don't speak about politics. They're fearful of it because... I mean, they know my views, but not because of me, but because they're fearful of what would happen, you know, uh, more broadly if they if they had their views. Maybe you're intimidating. No, I'm not. Actually, well, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm we're, not. Maybe we're on to something. Uh, did you say your thoughts? I do. I completely agree that what needs to what's missing is that there has to be an imposed education of how integration is a necessity. It's not. It's non-negotiable. But the whole idea of multiculturalism is a recognition of differences because no one wants to move towards a homo homogenized existence because it eradicates the value of the individual. Every culture is unique and has its value and contributory collectively is something that is positive. But I do agree that every individual pocket must be seen to function towards a collective good. That is why there has to, if you're an immigrant coming in, similar to what they have in Germany and the kind, when you want to get a visa in America and they make you go and study and take exams. There are things that should be fundamental that to be in Britain, you have to qualify above either equal to or above this threshold when it comes to functioning for the collective society. Speaking different languages, that is not a problem, but you do have to speak English. You have to function in office spaces because that is the, the language of the country. I agree with all of that because Britain is Britain and there has to be a respect for Britain. But for Britain to be Britain, you do not need the eradication of everyone else. We talked previously about nuclear power. Look at when Rishi Sunan talks about nuclear power. How do you get nuclear energy? It's from uranium. Where does the majority of you UK's uranium come from? Namibia. What does that say? In order to make the UK better, you can farm the resource of another country to make you better. So why will a why does Africa function to make you better, but an African in your country is made to feel like they're not worth the recognition? Well, it's completely... That is not... No, it's, no it's international not, trade is not synonymous no. with people coming no, it's freely into that, your it's country. Just that with one hand, you can recognise the value of a collective good, but on the other hand, you see it as a threat. That doesn't work But we presumably way. pay for the uranium we import. Oh, I mean, we could go into that and how that yeah. isn't exactly <laughs> the kind of payments that it should be. But I'm showing, showing, showing that UK can recognise, like, even... If I were to let me have a moment of complete eradication of my feeling and I put in a box what I think of colonialism and just look at it as a business model. Britain is Britain, you want to make it great. They realized in and of themselves of the country they did not have what they needed to achieve the greatness they wanted. And so they went no, to the exploration. No, that's completely no, misunderstanding is, no, how the British Empire I'm, Emerge. I'm, no, I'm waking. I'm, I'm trying to <laughs> make it a business model, not the actuality. The of what Europeans it was. had a business model of empire. We, we didn't. We then, went abroad. We traded. We settled up. We are going, we're going into yeah. what actually what actually happened, particularly in Nigeria and other places like that. When you're going to farm resource from other countries because you recognise they have something of value that could benefit you, I have no problem with that. The execution was inhumane, and then we get into the minutiae of the problems with that whole model. That is, a, it shows that this is a country that knows collective value is a good is a greater good. Um, well, we'll carry on this conversation after the break. I'll tell you what, it's also a country that knows that it's absolutely shameful and disgusting that that Batley uh, grammar school teacher is still in hiding. Honestly, you need to look at this report, everybody. Uh, the way he has been failed is absolutely eye-watering. Uh, Christopher Herp asked the author of that report for me today whether or not she thinks he should get some kind of state compensation. She didn't really answer that question, which I thought was a little bit of a shame. Anyway, the conversation will carry on in two. Headliners. Tomorrow's papers tonight, every night from 11pm. Is a debate on gender really a far-right issue?
Far right. I'm so bored of that phrase, you know what I mean? Like, anyone who talks about... Anyone who acknowledges that there are two sexes is suddenly far right, because that's what, that's what Hitler and Mussolini were all about. Um, this, this question from Shirley is, of course, about Labour. They've been accused of being undemocratic because they pressured a pub into cancelling a debate, and this debate features Kelly J. Keane, who's been on this show a couple of times, uh, and she's a campaigner, and she was just on the panel, and then they got a letter saying that they couldn't do it because Kelly J. Keane apparently attracts far-right groups. Now, they've tried this trick before, but because some awful, ghastly neo-Nazi types turned up near to an event that she was holding in Australia, they kind of tried to blame that on her and suggest that the two were the same thing. They weren't. That was an opportunistic group turning up to... They're not... Neo-Nazis aren't pro-feminist. <laughs> they're, they're not pro an event called Let Women Speak. That's just ridiculous. <laughs> New Zealand's uh, TV uh, blurred her, uh, touching her zip, because they said that her touching her zip was a far-right uh, dog whistle, because she's, she's She's making that symbol. Yeah, but when she, she wasn't making the symbol. Wow. She was just adjusting a zip. Yeah. And, and also, happened. also, this isn't a far right symbol. I mean, that's, that was incredible because she obviously wasn't making that symbol anyway. She was just adjusting a top. But this New Zealand uh, news channel blurred out the hand so that they could <laughs> pretend that it was some horrible ghastly. Yeah. I mean, well, this she's, is she's, a Wait, she's talked about having voted Labour in the past. She's yeah. so not far right. But also, I mean... even if she were right wing, which she yes. isn't, why would they be banning a panel where there's a discussion about an? One of the most important issues of our day. What well, are Labour playing out here? They're anti-democratic, aren't they? They're just kind of playing whack-a-mole with things they don't like. I think yeah. maybe I'll write to the pub and say I do want to see Kelly J. Keane there. Yeah, but it's... they won't listen to you well, if no, you they say won't. that, will they? Because you've got the unfashionable opinion, Chris. Well, I'm the unfashionable workplace. <coughs> I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Hi there, I'm Michelle Jubritel, 7 Deputy Leader of Reform UK. Ben Habib is alongside me, as is the broadcast journalist Judita De Silva. Welcome back, everybody. We're carrying on that conversation about the Cannes Review today, uh, which basically says when it comes to social cohesion, the country is a little bit of a mess, to put it uh, mildly. One of my viewers, Andy, uh, has written in and said, Michelle, look at the country. The leaders of England, Scotland and Wales are all from my no ethnic minorities. If that's not successful integration, I don't know what is. Well, I, I, I think it actually proves that um, multiculturalism isn't working. We've got a First Minister of Northern Ireland who wants to break the United Kingdom up, won't condemn IRA terrorism. We've got a First Minister in Scotland who wants to take Scotland out of the United Kingdom and has um, all sorts of uh, inclinations towards Hamas in a way that I would find intolerable for anyone holding high office in this country to have. And then you've got... Um, well, you've got, you know, whatever you've got in Wales, which is a bit peculiar. And then we've got England, which actually doesn't really govern itself. No, I don't think, yeah. I don't think multiculturalism is working. And if you're to take your lead from devolution, I think you just, you, you prove the point. But I think the point that Andy, the viewer, was making is that so many people and so many reports or whatever say, well, this country is institutionally racist. But if the country was institutionally racist, then why would those leaders of the highest office in those areas uh, come from ethnic minority backgrounds? Well, you see, that's, the, that thing that's, that's something that always fascinates me, which is actually when I was looking at the structure of social cohesion, it's a point that's made, that people laser in on things like race and religion and forget about the totality of what the purpose of social cohesion is. So the con we have one conversation about Islam, then have a conversation about black and white, and then have a conversation about LGBTQIA+. And I'm just thinking that you're lasering in on certain things that are so polarizing because they've fallen into the fractures of when you have a group 
What's that polarizing is... about Andy's observation? No, He's no, just pointing no, out that the he's three He's pointing out that, oh, they're not white. Yeah. I'm saying that that's irrelevant. Are they the best person for the job? Remember the conversation we had when I said a company is improved where you get to see everyone and pick the best person. But would you get rid of DEI? Would you get rid of diversity? I wouldn't get DEI. I make it more function more um, effectively. So what is the purpose of DEI? DEI is, like I said before, Look at everyone equally because you never but know where the what best it says. person is. That's not what it says. No, I, that's the function I believe it has. That's why I said I would regulate it to make it function more effectively. But it advocates for having ethnic minorities. The minute you advocate in a regulatory framework for a particular outcome, you've tipped the balances. Everyone's but that's not why equal. I agreed with you that I'm 100% yeah. for a meritocracy. But I'm telling you from lived experience, there are certain competitions I don't even get to be in because of preconceptions. Like I what? know I'm you know, good enough. Can I, I just say I don't something? I need to go into my, my private but life Judica, right now. I, I mean, I'm saying that I can, I'm not just speaking like out of conjecture yeah. and theory. It is true that there are certain places we don't even get to compete. I'm not saying give it to me over a white person because I'm black. That's insulting to my capability. I'm saying get me in the room and I'll prove to you I'm the best person for that, yeah. for that position because I know my capability. And that's an admirable approach. But I have to challenge you on the notion that the United Kingdom is in any way institutionally racist against ethnic minorities. The, 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 the prejudice goes the other way. It's against white people. That's how, that's how topsy-turvy our society's become. We promote ethnic and other minorities over and above it's, into the detriment of... It's fine to say that across the board, Britain is not institutionally racist across the board. Will you say categorically there is no aspect, no areas, no sectors in Britain that have institutional racism? I have racism? institutional racism? No. There may be personal racism. I don't believe there's an institutional racism against ethnic yeah, minorities. Yeah. I believe we are now institutionally racist against the majority. Uh, I can tell you now, there'll be a lot of people at home absolutely agreeing with that sentiment. I can hear you all the way from here. This conversation, though, uh, we certainly didn't conclude it here. It will rumble on for another day. But for now, uh, thank you very much, Adita. Thank you very much, you. Ben Habib. And you know the drill as well. You're very important, of course, to the show. So thank you to all of you uh, for choosing to spend that last hour with us. Also, don't get anywhere, though, because Nigel Farage is up next. But from me, that's all. Night night. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. This is your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Good evening to you. The rest of this week, well, be prepared for further heavy downpours and temperatures staying around about or a little bit below average. Low pressure is well and truly in control of our weather and will be for the rest of this week. These weather fronts have been making for a pretty soggy day for much of the UK. The rain across Scotland, falling of snow over the hills, that continues in the east through the night. Elsewhere, it does turn a little bit drier, uh, staying fairly cloudy and some staying fairly chilly temperatures down into single figures not far freezing in northern Scotland and small wintry showers coming into the northern and the western isles as we go into Tuesday still a bit more snow over the Grampians although that should ease further showers though to come in the east coast of Scotland central and southern Scotland looking a little bit drier compared to today it'll be a wetter day though